And Judith is the star of the show, but she's allowed me to, to get us introduced. And uh, so I, I'm going to do that really quick, and then I will quickly get out of the way uh, for the real purpose of the meeting, and, and Judith will have the ball. But um, I personally, I, I woke up very excited today and uh, about making these introductions. Uh, so since Judith has given me permission, I'm going to do it Epperson style here. Uh, met Judith many, many years ago, uh, I think around 10 years ago uh, through our Oklahoma Wesleyan MBA. And uh, they were giving her a really hard time about her credits and, and TOEFL scores. And, um, and, and I met with her and we chatted and, and I knew immediately that, that she was part of the kingdom. Uh, not only is she gonna be in my MBA program, but, but I heard her story about her heartbeat around the Rwandan genocide. Um, Judith became my first grad assistant. Uh, we managed to, uh, to try to get her paid. And what she's done uh, and what she's working on with empowerment has blown my mind. Um, I didn't see clients that had more time, more money, more education do infinitely less than or than uh, Judith was pulling off. Um, I've seen the product of her work. Uh, I've spent a lot of years telling her I am not going to Uganda. <laughs> and um, I, I think it's it's fun how this has turned out and that we're we're talking about Uganda. Um, I want to introduce Rochelle. Uh, Rochelle is an associate pastor at Winfield United Methodist Church, and uh, she oversees missions there. And most of all, uh, and most all of the external uh, facing ministries of the church. Um, she, in her younger days, she was an international buyer, uh, a sourcer. Uh, she traveled extensively throughout Asia. Prior to that, uh, something that I'm impressed by is Rochelle attended the top two art schools in the country, uh, left, left business to start a family, uh, raised, raising her teen, three teenage children, accepted a call to full-time ministry and started doing that after those, those kiddos grew up uh, enough to, to take care a little bit of themselves. She's a pastor teacher with a real niche in the unconventional uh, new ministry outlets, kind of things that we've not done before is, is a passion, um, passion for her. Um, she's a conservative who attends Duke and uh, Duke Divinity because she wanted the rigor, which I, I appreciated. Uh, she's a COO through and through. She's also why I became a Methodist and uh, <laughs> proud, proud to introduce her as my girl. And uh, so that is Rochelle. So everyone say hi to Pastor Rochelle. <laughs> hey. already. And then I want to introduce Dr. Roxy Davis. Uh, Dr. Roxy is a uh, master of social work, uh, is the program director, professor for the Newman University's master of social work program. Um, she joined Newman uh, just last year. Uh, she offices out of the University of Colorado Springs outreach location that Newman has there. She's a licensed clinical social worker. Uh, she has certifications in early childhood and advanced early childhood. Uh, one thing that I was personally impressed by is she was also presented uh, the Excellence in Teaching Award in an Integration of Faith and Learning. Um, Roxy's also uh, a licensed minister. And the moment I met her, uh, I knew she was a Jesus follower the, the minute I met her. And uh, I read her bio uh, when I was trying to introduce her to Judith. And, and I wanted to share one statement. Here's what she wrote. And this is out on our website at Newman University. This is Roxy. God brought both my passions together, and I get to do that every day. Social work and being a servant. Social work and being a servant. 
I have both of my passions and feel like I'm fulfilling what God put me on earth to do. And she goes on to say, I always tell my students, Jesus was the first social worker. He went to the outcasts, the individuals with mental health issues, the hungry. He showed compassion and he showed love and he healed them through his love. Love this. Jesus <laughs> is our prime example of being a social worker. We can bring healing to others and have and love people back to life. Love that. That's uh, Dr. Roxy Davis. Roxy. Yes, and then, sir. And then one last thing I want to, on, on my end of the thing, introduce Peter. Um, Peter is my, I call him my senior, call him my elder. Um, Rochelle is not proud of me for calling Peter my elder, but he is my mentor. Um, Peter was is president of the Joseph Group. Uh, he's, he's founded a, a, an organization called Impact for Truth. I think I got that right, Peter, didn't I? Okay. Um, five years as the president of the Texas Center for Family Rights. Uh, he was a graduate of Chuck Colson's Centurions program. He was a scholar, still a scholar in residence at Oklahoma Wesleyan. He's got his Juris Doctorate. He's, he's a good lawyer. Uh, his MBA from Oklahoma Wesleyan, uh, where I met Peter. Uh, he where where the first time I saw Peter, he was giving a biblical and rational basis for liberty and free enterprise. He's a scholar and you, you're not gonna outthink him and, and a graduate in history from Cornell. He's a man that is obsessed with God's word and he walks with Jesus. Uh, he's also one of the few men that I actually submit to. And um, one, one of the things I, I wanted to remind you and then, then get on, I'll shut up now, Judith, but this is a reminder again from Matthew 5. And when I was a young man, I heard Henry Blackaby um, say this one statement. I'll never forget it. It's stuck in my head. And it, he said, watch to see where God is working and join him in his work. And that's, that's my passion about this, uh, at least with um, Roxy and Rochelle and Peter. Uh, this is my passion. And the reminder, and we even talked about this with, uh, with you all yesterday, comes from Matthew 5, verse 13. I want to read this to you. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light bringing out the God colors in this world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there, a hilltop, shine. Judith, you got the ball. I am so glad. Thank you, everybody, for creating the time. Because of the way we are going to talk about this, I wanted the people in Uganda to almost have the, this first time to, to meet you, then try to tell them there's someone called Roxy, there's someone called Rochelle, and try to describe you. It was going to be very hard. So I invited, especially the leaders, the women leaders to come and meet you and hear the story firsthand so that we don't have to go back and uh, and repeat it. So I have a group of women leaders who are leading the work or doing the women empowerment on ground that we will talk about as we go on. I, I, I put in a map of Africa, not because you can't Google the map of Africa, but I wanted to honor my brother, number one, to tell him that Africa is not one big chunk. You know, when you're in the U.S., people think Africa is one big, like Oklahoma. But those are hundreds of countries. So I wanted to point out uh, to my brother that that's what it is. But if you go to the next one, the East African map, uh, your mouth, Kilimanjaro, Dr. E., 
is somewhere in Tanzania up northeast where you see Moshi. So please work hard. I just wanted to say, so let's pray. Father, I thank you for this meeting. I ask that your spirit will be with us. We will have fun as we do ministry, but also we'll be able to read the heart of God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, Dr. E already told you my story. When I came to the U.S., I, I felt like God was giving me an extraordinary uh, privilege because there are so many people who are in Africa that want to come and do their MBA here and do school here. But for I've always asked God, why me? Why am I the one who is being saved? Why am I being the one who is protected and provided for? So that is always, like I can't sleep. Why am I the one? Because I don't want to miss and think for one time that it is about me. It's about me getting all the, the shining stars. No. So when we got here uh, 10 years ago, that's how Ian was born, Empowering Nations. I felt God was telling me you're supposed to, to go and be the channel. Actually, the word he used was a conduit. And I looked up the meaning of a conduit is a person or a country connecting one place to another or one person to another. And that over the years has been defined differently. So in the beginning, when the empowering nations came up, I thought we were going to go get the women, trying to empower them. So I called one of the, the ladies, uh, Dr. E, you can go to the next one. I called one of the, it was Amabera. I said, Amabera, I can't sleep. What do we do? And we got a group of women together and we started doing as much as we can. Zero money, but with a big heart. I remember I could come to Dr. E and say, what do you think God is saying? Do we start with the pigs? And then he couldn't even understand the word pigs. He can hardly understand my accent. <laughs> What's wrong with the word pigs? Why don't you know? He couldn't, it's pigs. How do you say pigs in America? It's pigs, I thought, anyway. So I could come to his office, I, whether he's in the middle of something, I'd say, you have to help me process this. Where do you think God is, is telling us to go? And every word he spoke was an encouragement, was uh, it's what I needed for the moment to go on to the next level. So if you go to the next level where it says the, the PowerPoint that says, this is what we've done in the past. We thought we were going to go start small loans, teach them how to bake, do the skilling. We, we got a group of about 30, 50 people and did everything we could do. But then we, they were called empowering women, uh, empowering nations, women or group. Amabe was the one, Amabe was my uh, high school friend. I know she has a heart for women, so she was the one leading the team and doing all that. But in my heart, there was, there was a lack. It wasn't the exact thing that I thought we were supposed to do. So we, we came back together and said, this doesn't look like empowerment to me. Because as you saw, uh, we are the vision of empowering nations. I felt we were supposed to connect with leaders more than be on the ground trying to do all these things. Plus I was here, so that was even maybe a, a, a proof that I couldn't do all this. So we decided to concentrate on the leaders. So on the group now, there is Amabe. When we let uh, when we saw that this wasn't the way we were supposed to do, but we talked to Amabe and said, we know you have a heart for women. What is God telling you to do? Go do it. You know, she went, multiplied the group of 35. Now she's leading more than 300 women because she was no longer waiting for my instructions or to try to understand my vision. We empowered her. We said, go do what God tells you to do. We moved from 35 to 300. And on this group, there are all kinds of leaders who are just waiting for that one person to say, what is God telling you to do? What do you have that we can multiply? What do you have that is in your group? What, what, is, what is the women, what are the women in your group saying? What do they need? 
how can we reach out to them? And in empowering these leaders, then we are reaching out to the whole community. And I know I'm, I'm rushing through, but our focus, if you go about our next to the next slide, Dr. E, is now to focus on training, empowering, and supporting women with the burden for women empowerment and equipping them to fulfill their vision. So that's why I'm here. I came with all the women leaders, plus their husbands or friends, to make this petition to this group, to Rochelle, to Roxy, to Dr. E, to Peter, and to other people that are not here today, but I know will hear this voice. Will you join us to empower these leaders to go and empower the women that they lead? Because if you help me as Judy, I'm one person, but if you help Amma who comes with 300 and more, or Christine who comes with these teen mothers and their babies, then we are making an impact. So as we talk today, I want you to be thinking, just sense the spirit, what is God telling you? And we don't come with answers. We are not pretending that this is a processed job. That's why we're all here together, to build together. It's going to take you, Rachel, it's going to take you, Roxy, and me and Peter to, to try to pan a bit and define. I, I've seen EN grow from the time we began. We didn't begin like this. So I hope you can help us, you can join us and add your voice, add your exposure, add your influence, add whatever God has deposited in you to make this empowerment to women actually be a reality. The, the next, uh, that's why in the next PowerPoint I was trying to, to, to zero it down. I said I come today to ask for almost three things. Doctor, if you can go on. I said I would want to discuss some of the achievements and because of time, they all sent me their summaries. It, it's amazing what these people are doing. And you, I mean, after this, I'm going to create a group and add you you'll be amazed at what these people have been able to do with almost nothing. With no one advocating for them, with nothing that we can as a group input, input or invest. So imagine if we are able to come along and give them what it takes or help or stand with God. Imagine what the difference is going to be. It's just going to be that there's no limit. So I said, we, uh, I wanted to use one project as a focus because I know the needs uh, can be overwhelming. So I picked one of the, I thought was relevant for all of us as residents of the world, the, the effects of COVID on women. That is relevant, that is current, that everyone is, knows. That, I mean, there's no discipline trying to explain that. But you, especially uh, Uganda and East Africa has been hit hard because we already had group calls. One of the, uh, Dr. Ia said I couldn't use PowerPoints, I overtook them. One of the problems we had already with girls was that to empower girls, you have to keep them in school. But because of COVID and some of them are out of school, we, we have hundreds and thousands of girls who have dropped out of school. That means they've ended up being pregnant. Now, Christine, who is on, on the Zoom call today, I didn't call her to say, Christine, can you please talk to these girls? Can you see her? No, it was already in her heart. And to me, that blesses me. Then to have people wait for my instructions, she called me and said, Judy, please, how can you help us? And that's why I can't sleep. I say, what's going on? She's like, I have a group of more than, you know, she sent me at least 50 girls, teen girls who are pregnant. Some have given birth to twins and I don't know what to do with them. She just got a small room, put them in there. Every week she gives them a small package of food to go back home with. Some of, uh, I, I, I had a story. One of my sisters is a prosecutor. A 16 year old gave birth at home. And because she was of course scared of the repercussions, she killed the baby to hide what was going on and tried to bury the baby. And they, she, they prosecuted her, they charged her with murder. 
And I'm thinking, oh, mother, she's a baby. She even doesn't know what she's doing. Plus, she needs medical help. She needs help before you can even start. But the system is the system. They throw her in the system. And because you, it's a crime, yes, no one is going to think twice that this is a baby before you bring the mother charges. Who is helping her as a child? So it's just beyond me. In the article I sent was a specific uh, research that was done by Westminster Foundation for Democracy on the impacts of, of COVID and girls and women. Please read, read it. Uh, uh, you have the link. And I sent you some of the pictures of Christine and the women and what they're trying to do. What Christine's asking us is not to tell her what to do. She's already carrying this burden. But what are we going to do? Roxy, what are you going to do? Rochelle, what are you going to do? What am I going to do? Dr. E, what are you going to do? Otherwise, we are going to throw these girls into sex trafficking. They are going to sell themselves on the street. And then we will sit back here and be heartbroken because of all these people who are being trafficked and who are prosecuting and HIV. But I believe God has entrusted us with this. God is breaking our heart with this because God himself is the one who is going to show us what to do about it. I don't think it's going to be something out of the world, but God is giving us this burden because he can entrust us with it. And this is not just in the location where Christian is. This is something that cuts across. You go to Rwanda where Bishop Rose is and Pastor Norman, COVID is everywhere. So it can be multiplied. If we do well what Christine is doing, it can be multiplied in all these other places, in Kenya where Deborah is, in, in every place that is facing the same. So be thinking about it and ask God, God, why are you breaking my heart with this? And what do you want me to do? And God is going to show us. Because I, I believe this, this can only be God. We have things we can be doing, but this can only be God. So the pictures are there. The, the, I mean, this goes on every week. They come to the center. She wants to at least enlarge that place so that they are not congested. Plus, those are not, there's more out there. So let's talk details after this meeting. But this is the way forward for me. After this meeting, my request is that Ro Roxy and Rochelle and Dr. E and Peter and all the men on this call, you will want to, to know these people, these women leaders. You will want to know Christine. You will want to know what breaks her heart. You will want to know Amabel. You will want to know Bishop Rose. You will want to meet Deborah. You will want to meet Mercy and every woman on the ground who is going is having to, to be the face and to live with this every day. And then let God show you what your impact, what your contribution. So that is one, one request. That together you will want to mentor, you will want to know, you will want to, to understand. But I always tell my American friends, it's almost impossible, almost. I didn't say it's impossible, almost impossible to know how to be effective or to be used in Africa unless you have ever put, uh, set foot on the ground. Unless you go on the ground and meet the people and see for yourself, it's almost impossible. It's just, a, it's almost another heartbreaking story. And that's not, as a church, as a Christian, that's not what Christ wants us to do, not to hear bad stories, but he has given us the power to speak life in some instances. But also he's given us everything, the training, now I have MBA for what? If it's not going to expand the kingdom. So all these things that God has already done so I'm also encouraging you. That's why I started with Mount Kilimanjaro, Dr. E. If we can use Mount Kilimanjaro to get into Africa, I'm in for it. Because before you get to Mount Kilimanjaro, I hope you meet the women. 
and you go visit uh, Pastor Gilbert and Pastor Apple and all these people. So if it is Mount uh, Kilimanjaro, let's do it. Roxy, I don't know what you would want to do in Africa, but let's do it. But uh, that aside, so two things I hope that uh, I can say that we have achieved in this meeting is for, for there to be a follow-up, a mentorship. I hope you can be, uh, I wanted to use uh, Proverbs and we all know the scripture, uh, be a voice to the voiceless. In uh, Proverbs 31, uh, Lamuel, the mother of Lamuel is telling him, the king, please don't drink. But when I read that scripture, he's not saying don't drink so that you don't get drunk. The mother is saying, don't drink, because if you drink, you will forget to give justice to the poor, to the disadvantaged. And I was like, the mother could have told her other reasons, but she said justice to those who deserve it, to the un, un, undeserved and un, what, underprivileged, the weak, the poor. That is the group she said, don't drink because you'll be impaired to give justice to those who deserve it. And to me, that was a, a big burden. It was a big call. But also he's saying, uh, uh, that's why in verse 8 says, you know what, be a voice. The mother, that's the mother telling his son, be a voice. He didn't say, go be a strong man, go conquer the lands, go do this powerful thing. He's saying, be a voice to the voiceless to those who cannot speak for themselves. And I feel that's what God is telling us to do. He's not going to, he's not telling us to go win the whole world. But right now he's asking us to be a voice to the voiceless, to these, to these girls who have, are having to kill their children because they can't figure out how to, they can't think of tomorrow. And these are girls who are already in poverty, who are already in need. So to, if you say Christine is, has 50 girls that she's having to work with, no, that's not true. Christine has 100 people she has to deal with because every child, every girl is coming pregnant. Some have even given birth to, to twins. So don't, that number is even not, not true. So God is asking us, can we be the voice? Can we be a voice today? And I've asked Peter, I don't know if you're still with us. He wanted to run out. As our church today, I'd asked Peter. Peter, you still with us? Good. Yes, I'm here. Uh, and, uh, and I'm almost done. I've asked Peter to read for us the names of these girls. I hope he can read fast. I know he can, he's been practicing. But <laughs> as we read each name, I want you, I want to ask yourself, me as Judy, what am I going to do? Me as Peter, what am I going to do? We are mothers. Imagine if my child was on that list. Would it would I still do the same? Would I still act the same? So Peter, are you ready to go? After Peter reads the, the names. Your, your open, please ask questions. Uh, we'll just, the closing prayer will be next. Okay. Jonah, Immaculate, Talent, Claire, Hope, Agatha, Medias, Naomi, Claudia, Fausta, Naomi, Joyce, Charity, Kellen, Prossy, Lynette, Lauren, Fosca, Eunuch, Gius, Faith, Annette, Jillian, Procinia, Doran, Joy, Prudence, Rebecca, Katrina, Glorious, Ruth, Charity, Lillian, Agnes, Josephine, Sincere, Beatrice, Rita, Pros, Robina, Enid, Loida, 
Shine, Gloria, Macklin, Eunice, Christine, Justine, Rita, and Kareem. Thank you so much. Thank you. So unless Dr. E, it's it's up to you. Roxy had to step off because she's in this meeting that that we're supposed to be in. Mm -hmm. She since she's in charge, she's running that one. But uh, I wanted to see if there were any any questions, um, particularly from uh, Peter or Rochelle. Rochelle, you're you've not had an opportunity to really really hear the vision and kind of the mission of, of what their work uh, consists of. Any, any questions in particular or just thoughts for Judith? Um, hi, Judith. I'm so, um, first off, I'm so blessed to, that you've asked um, for me to just listen in and get to know you and hear about your mission. And of course I, I can only assume that we're all just incredibly moved by your story, but I don't want to leave it there. It's to be moved is one thing, but to be moved into action is another. And so in order to uh, make sure I am understanding the vision and the, the heart behind empowering nations, um, is it my understanding? Am I correct in understanding that what you are, um, what you are seeking to do, and it sounds like what you are already doing is you, um, this ministry is one that you're asking folks um, to come and help be mentors, be in relationship with, be partners with the leaders that are on the ground in East Africa in order so that they may go out and in turn empower the young women um, and families that are there in Uganda and in other places. Um, so it, I guess that's just a lot of words for me to ask. Um, what, you're, what you're looking for from us is um, just some partnerships and mentorships with your leaders that are on the ground there in East Africa. Yes, mom. Yes, mom. That is the one thing that okay. I hope can happen. Mm -hmm. And then I, the immediate need for looking at what's happening is how do we help these teen mothers? Okay. Because the leaders is one group. Right. The leaders are here. It's Christine, it's uh, Sissy, they're here. So I hope that, that partnership, I mean, that mentorship can even start now. But at yeah. the same okay. time, as we do that, what do we do? Because the girls are here. They want right. to eat every day. They have babies who need help. So what do we do? So th th there are those two. Okay. Yeah. Yes, but thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I ask one more follow-up question yes. to that, Judith? Yes. Yes. Um, so while um, I would assume others like myself, we have some experience in um, praying with, serving alongside of, um, helping and educating young women in the United States um, that may be struggling um, with education, with um, early, becoming early parents, um, different situations, um, different types of poverty. Um, what are some of the cultural differences between what we may have knowledge and experience in, in in partnering with here in the United States versus Uganda. What how might that look different? How how might we be able to kind of bridge the cultural gap there? Yeah, and I think sometimes I think that's why I'm in the US to, to try to understand two worlds. Now I can't tell you that I am perfect. Like I know the, everything about the African culture, and now I know everything about the U.S. culture. That's why you're here. So maybe you worry about the U.S. culture, and I will worry about the African culture. But people are people. Children are children. Right. If I if I'm a teen and I have a, a child, there is no culture. It's plain truth. I have a baby, and I'm a baby. I need help. My baby needs help. I need help to go back to school. 
be encouraged to go back to school because girls are now re resorting to early marriage. So there might be cultural differences, but not in the case that would stop the both worlds working together to help the girls we are targeting. Okay. So th I think uh, th let's not worry so much about that. It might be language, it might be other things on the side, but the target of what we need to do to help the teen herself and her baby, there shouldn't be a problem. There might be a problem with just the logistics and how things work around and who supervises what. All. So those are more outside. So that we, and we might need time to do that. But that is a big question. That's why I need people like you, Rochelle, to ask those questions. Because if we can't define those cultural differences and we're bringing people on board, then they'll ask us and we don't have answers. But let's deal with that right now. Thank you, Peter. No, thank you. Thank you. Judith, I have a question. Yes, Peter. Um, in, in light of those who become or could be mentors for these teenagers and such, uh, how does that, how might that work as far as communication? I mean, obviously all of us on this Zoom call are able to get on Zoom. Um, I'd be surprised if all of the teenage girls would be able to do something like that. So is there a way that you foresee how, for those women who could be mentors of some of these young ladies, how that might work? Can, any thoughts on that? Yeah, and the leaders of this group, I think will be the buffer. They will be the in-between. They might have to interpret. They might have to, and uh, that's why creating a relationship with the people on this team is, is key is crucial because they might have to be the ones to to interpret you or interpret the message and let it get to to where it's supposed to be but most of the people in uganda as long as they've gone to school they are able at least to hear or understand english they might not speak it and maybe to the way you understand it but at least they will understand what you're saying and then if there's need, there is always, uh, there's also interpretation. We have to interpret. We've actually asked the same question about these Zoom meetings we are having in the leadership classes. At what point for us to be able to reach masses, are we going to have to introduce an interpreter? So that even if someone doesn't speak English, so it's something we are watching. As we continue going into the villages or maybe where there are not people, who speak English but want to know about leadership because everybody's a leader, we are going to have to introduce that. So that, that's a good question. But again, Peter, let's go. Your communication will be fine. I promise you, <laughs> you'll be hard. Um, Judith, what is the um, primary language or the first language of most of these teen girls that you are working with? Those who have gone to school will speak English, but mostly uh, I think Uganda and the leaders on this team can put in the chat for me. Sorry, I have to mute all of you. But I think we have more than 56 directs. Okay. Like every tribe will speak their tribal language. However, we have some key uh, languages that almost help us to meet together. Luganda is mostly spoken in the central. Okay. And sometimes some people speak a little bit of Swahili, but then it's English for most of the people. And where there's a problem with that, I promise you we have interpreters. By the way, Sisi, Dr. Sisi is on this chat. She interprets her husband, Dr. Birunji, and she's a very, I was telling her the other time, she's so good with interpreting. The leaders, I think, I can see most of them doing the interpreting in case it is uh, an English problem. Okay. And I had a related question. Um, Pastor Norman, I, I think you're in Rwanda, and forgive my ignorance, but what is the official language in Rwanda? Kinyarwanda. Kinyarwanda is different from what they speak it's from Kinyarwanda. Uh, official language uh the medium is now english but we have kinyarwanda as our national language 
that brings us together, not like other East African countries where they have uh, many languages. Yeah, that's the advantage of, of here in Rwanda. I think what Sister Judith is saying that uh, strategically, that's uh, the main focus of these early uh, pregnancies of these young girls. As a uh, sister uh, uh, who is involved in that group, Christine, Christine mm -hmm. uh, she has a heart, as uh, Sister Judith was saying, but there's always this, uh, this gap where you have a big heart to support these uh, vulnerable groups. And then uh, you reach a point where you, there's, uh, uh, let me say, a blockage. Uh, you are overwhelmed. Y you need empowerment in, uh, in, in skills. How do you train uh, your team? How to handle such uh, yeah. social, economic, psychological issues between these groups that you are involved in? So, uh, how do you support them economically? How do you support them psychologically? And all those kind of things. So, Sister Judith, of course, she's in the U.S. with a big heart, and of course, Christine. So, what I want just to say that uh, uh, for us who are the ground, we see those areas that needs to be intertwined together to meet the big problem. Like people in the U U.S., you have experiences where you, 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 you know how to handle the people infected by uh, social issues, psychological, other pregnancies and those kind of things. But for us here in Africa and maybe East Africa, as I said, we lack all these skills. So, so she's saying that in other words, there's a big need that needs to be, uh, that needs hands to, sub to be supportive. So those are the things that really, we really need. And when she gives an example of Christine, that's exactly, uh, to me, that's what, uh, uh, if all these things would be brought together for the common, bring all these issues together, then uh, we are lifting a, a big, uh, uh, this vulnerable society, vulnerable group, and to another point. So that's what I wanted just to, 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 to share. This is the, one of the biggest challenges when it comes to that issue, like say, what Christine is, uh, is involved in. Okay, so I don't know, I don't want to keep you for long, plus my group is coming in very soon. So uh, Rochelle, if you don't mind, and Peter and Dr. E, would you mind a follow-up meeting to just now try to process all this? It can be with the leaders if you want them to be there. It can be with me. It can be with the three of you, <laughs> depending on what you guys need to talk about. But let's, let's take um, another... Let's plan for a follow-up meeting. That's what I'm asking for. Is that a good thing? Yes. Rochelle, would you okay? Peter, are you okay with that? Yes, please. And Dr. E. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll yeah. absolutely do that. We'll, we'll do that, yes. So if that is okay, let me ask uh, Davis. Would you mind praying for us? Let's pray. Yes, yeah, Heavenly Father. We are grateful to you for the opportunity you've given us to meet and to share uh, on this very touching matter, the issue of the vulnerable girls, especially in East Africa, and what is happening in their lives. It touches us so much. And now, Lord, we lift it to you that you alone will take it up. And we ask that, Lord, you give us the wisdom, the resources, and the knowledge that we need together to tackle this matter. Whatever we can do, Lord, help us to do it. We thank you for those you're bringing on board. We pray, oh God, that you continue to cut it down in their hearts, that they will understand it fully. And Lord, whatever you, whatever thing you really want them to accomplish with this, Lord, 
give them the ability, give them the resources. We trust you and we know that, Lord, one day we shall surely be seeing victory in this. And we know COVID is going for nothing ever comes and continues when you have not permitted it. I know COVID must go. Our trust is in you, Lord, and we are overcoming this scourge in the name of Jesus. We bless your name. We ask you to be with us even as we go to our beds and those who are still uh, in office and backing on other things. Lord, we pray you be with them as well. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we have prayed. Amen.